There I was, in the middle of one of my daily excursions into the deep web. Yeah, I know it's dangerous. I know the horror stories of viruses, cyber stalking, and fringe porn. That's still not enough to stop me from firing up Tor and heading down pirated television shows. I won't tell you the name of the site, but there I was, scrolling through its library of old Seinfeld episodes. That's when I noticed it. An episode not listed under any of the seasons. Seinfeld Black, it was titled simply enough. A lost episode? An episode starring the cast as black people? I wondered. Being a huge fan of the show, I was sure I'd seen every episode. The thought of seeing a new one had me intrigued. Without hesitation, I clicked the link and began the download. It only took a few minutes for my player to pop up and stream the video. If you've ever seen the show, and who hasn't, you'll know it usually opens with an upbeat theme music, lots of pop and jazz riffs. Not here. The opening shot was of Jerry's apartment, surely enough, but the music was different. The tune was ominous and discordant. A booming, strung-out score thrummed through my speakers and climaxed and into a rattle not unlike that of a venomous snake. The next shot was of Jerry inside his apartment, eating a bowl of cereal over the sink. At least I was pretty sure it was him. His eyes had dark circles under them, and his face was lined and haggard, like he hadn't slept in days. Even his clothing looked wrinkled and disheveled. The door suddenly burst open and slid Kramer in his usual clumsy fashion. Finally, I thought, Kramer is always funny, even had the same goofy appearance. Now things will lighten up for sure. Hey buddy, he said, I need to borrow your freezer. What? Why? Jerry asked, his voice sounding hoarse and tired. The bodies, Jerry. I need to find some place to dispose of them. The police at the dump are getting suspicious. Kramer, you just can't keep killing people. You're going to get caught and I'm not going down with you. Jerry dumped his bowl into the sink with several other unwashed dishes and empty liquor bottles. Jerry, this has given my life new meaning, Kramer exclaimed. Remember when they thought I was a smog strangler? Well, in prison, I got to thinking. This is how I want to be remembered. Cosmo Kramer, New York's deadliest serial killer. He gestured his hands as if, as if outlining words in front of them. It's bad enough I've got Elaine shooting up heroin in my bathtub. There's no way you're keeping human remains here. Oh, come on, Kramer pleaded as he collapsed onto Jerry's couch. Ah, uh, this was getting weird. Pudgy bald George then strolled through the open apartment door, a mischievous smirk upon his face. His eyes twinkled behind his glasses. Hey, George, how's a new job going? Jerry asked. It's a job I was born for, Jerry. Being a mortician's assistant is really my calling. You seem pretty chipper for this job, Jerry said suspiciously. Maybe a little too chipper, George rose his eyebrows. You don't mean... Jerry's words were only met with George's smile. You're having sex with dead people now? Loving it, Jerry, George exclaimed. They just lie there and you do whatever you want to them. It's like you're being paid to be in a relationship without the emotional baggage. Are you crazy? You're going to get fired or get the disease or something. Ah, that's just an urban legend. George dismissed him with a wave of his hand. Hey, buddy. Kramer suddenly jumped up and slapped his hands together excitedly. I've got some fresh ones at my place I'm looking to get rid of. You could even have some fun with them first. George looked thoughtful. You could do your thing. Bring the bodies to me, and I'll feed them to Newman. Kramer smacked his lips and spoke in his trademark. Get here. What's going on with him, anyway? Seems like I haven't seen him lately, Jerry asked. Newman? Kramer answered. He's been confined to bed for the past six months. Poor guy ate so much he can barely move anyway. Must weigh over 600 pounds by now. He pays me a cut of his disability checks to bring him lunch. I can just mix the flesh of Kramer's victims with the food once I'm done with them, pocket the money, and he'll be none the wiser, George said with glee. This could really work. Kramer was visibly excited. I need new friends moaned Jerry. There was no canned laughter. The scene cut to a black and white view of Jerry on stage doing his comedy routine. They're sitting on a stool in front of his microphone, looking as maniacally depressed as ever, a lit cigarette between his fingers. I was confused, since he had never smoked on the show before. What's the deal with necrophilia? he asked the audience. 
At what point in your life do you become so desperate for sex that you say, I'm here, I'm horny, let's crack open a cold one? Funerals for these people must be like nightclubs to us. Oh, sure that blonde is cute, but one in the casket can't say no. Throw in cannibalism, and if you get yourself dinner and a date, you're having your cake and eating it too. Jeffrey Dahmer, now there's a guy that can have his cake and eat it too. The scene was not only devoid of color, but the laugh track was also absent. Cue the same creepy theme music and transition to a city street at night. A woman is fumbling with her car keys when Kramer suddenly appears behind her and seizes her from behind. With one hand clasped over her mouth, he uses the other to wield a huge butcher knife that he plunged into her sternum. Her screams become more muffled until her body went limp. Next scene. George was sitting in a chair beside Newman's bed, a bucket of food on the floor between his legs. The curtains were shut with a dimly lit light bulb, being the only source of light. I guess he'd been inside for so long he could no longer handle bright light. Didn't they have jambalaya? Newman asked. Kramer's description didn't do him justice. He was naked, a mountain of fat that you'd need a forklift to transport. Just talking seemed to take the wind out of him. Nah, just spicy beef, answered George as he hefted a large wooden spoon from the bucket to Newman's mouth. Something fell off the spoon as George went back for another mouthful. A close-up camera shot revealed that it was a mangled human thumb laying on the carpet. Panicking, George frantically picked up the appendage and placed it back on the spoon before feeding it to Newman. More creepy music. Back at Jerry's apartment, Elaine was sitting on the floor outside of Jerry's bathroom, clearly strung out on heroin. A thin sheen of sweat covered her emaciated frame. Track marks from prolonged use were visible on her arms, and her unwashed hair was tangled around her shoulders. Jerry. Jerry, please, I just need a little more, she begged. You're not getting any, Jerry yelled. One trip to prison and my friends will become junkies, murderers, and necrophiliacs, he shook his head disapprovingly. Kramer fell out of Jerry's bedroom door, a large bundle wrapped in bedsheets strung over his shoulder. He stumbled around for several moments, his feet slipping in a pool of blood as he struggled to regain his balance. It would have been funny in her under circumstances. Hey, buddy, he finally said with a smile after regaining his composure. What is this? Jerry whined. Oh, I just found her in your bedroom and thought I'd add her to my collection, Kramer explained. That's Tina, you stupid idiot. She's my girlfriend. We're supposed to go to Mexico at the end of next week. Well, she wouldn't stop looking at me funny, Kramer defended himself. You don't understand this lifestyle, Jerry. There are rules. If I don't follow them, I get bugs under my skin. Just get her out of here, Jerry said with a note of finality. Kramer started to carry the bundle towards the door before George burst in. Kramer, his nasally voice intoned. You need to be more gentle. The last one you gave me was barely in one piece. It was like making love to a hamburger. Sorry, buddy. I guess a little bit carried away. Hey, Jerry, do you have any skin cream here? It's all itchy down there. That's from having sex with those corpses, you know that, right? Jerry scolded George. Nah, I have a doctor's appointment for tomorrow. He'll get it straightened out. He turned his attention back to Kramer. Did you remember to change Newman's bedpan? Me? I thought it was your job. I just spent two hours giving him a sponge bath. You know, that place smells like a sewer mixed with a slaughterhouse. Let's get this over to Newman's now, Kramer suggested with a grin of anticipation. He awkwardly tried to pass the bundle to George before the two started stumbling around again. Get out, get out, get out! Jerry started freaking out at their antics. The pair quickly rushed Tina's body out the door. Next scene. Kramer was stalking the city streets at night again when he notices a woman by herself under a streetlight. Drawing his weapon, he slowly sneaks up behind her before seizing her around the neck with one arm. Please, please! Red and blue lights light up the night as dozens of weapons are locked onto Kramer. She had been a decoy, not one to be taken alive. Kramer sliced open her jugular before his body was torn apart by a hail of gunfire. The scene ends with Kramer sprawled out on the pavement, his body twitching faintly. Blood gurgles from his mouth as his eyes stare lifelessly at the sky above. At Jerry's apartment, George lets himself in. Jerry. Jerry, he calls out with no answer. He suddenly notices Elaine's lifeless body pop up against the wall with an empty syringe stuck in her arm. 
She has died of an overdose. George rubs his chin ponderously and starts to unbutton his shirt before the music signals the next scene transition. I was relieved it didn't show what happened next. Newman is somehow managing to spoon-feed himself from the bucket, one mouthful at a time. A diet of human flesh seemed to have only made him more corpulent. The skin of his belly strained to contain the fat underneath. It was as if he could burst at any time. Suddenly, he drops the spoon and starts gagging. A bone from one of Kramer's victims has gotten caught in his throat and he's choking. He thrashes and wheezes while before turning still. The final shot frames his face with his lips turning blue. At the doctor's office, George is sitting on a bed wearing a hospital gown, smiling to himself. The door swings open and in walks the disgruntled doctor. What's the news? George asks giddily. I'm afraid I have bad news, Mr. Costanza, the doctor begins. It seems you have contracted a very rare disease and only have 48 hours left to live. Wait, what? George is now shocked. I'm afraid it's even worse than that. Mr. Costanza, this particular type of disease is only found in individuals who partake in intimate relations with the deceased. Out of concern for public safety, I'm going to personally ensure that your last 48 hours will be spent in solitary confinement. You're a sick man. The scene ends with George looking sheepish and embarrassed before the music cuts in. Jerry is back on stage in the same black and white scene as before. That's the thing, isn't it? We're all just meat. Life has no meaning. You bang a lot of women, and then you go out with a bang. Dropping the cigarette, he reaches behind his back and produces a shiny black metallic object it took me a second to recognize as a pistol. He slowly slid the barrel into his mouth. There's no music as the screen fades to black. A single gunshot rings out as the credits start to roll. The only sound after that is the audience of the comedy club screaming. I sat on my monitor in shock for a few minutes after the episode ended. What the hell had I just seen? Did the real cast of Seinfeld agree to film this abomination? Or had they just hired lookalikes to play the characters? Better not think about it, I decided. With trembling hands, I closed Tora and powered down my computer.